I'm going to say welcome to Marianne. We appreciate you joining us tonight to talk to us about asters. This has been a, and probably more. Um, Marianne is, uh, as we, you know, we do, we do all this as volunteers. Marianne is no, uh, no stranger to not only volunteering, but also does this for a living. She's um, a freelance journalist, a photographer. Um, you're an instructor, I believe, at uh, Bowman's Hill Wildflower. Is that a refuge? It's a preserve. Bowman's okay, Hill preserve. Um, yeah, she's a master naturalist. And I believe you also do the editing for NABA, the North American Butterfly Association's um, magazine. Yeah, butterfly gardener. That's yeah, great. so so she does uh, quite a bit, both for work and for fun. And uh, so if you all will, um, yeah, we just appreciate you being here. Welcome, and we will let you get started. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And um, all those things that I do, I just do them for fun. <laughs> um, so anyway, today you guys have invited me to talk to you about asters, and it's just a lovely time of year to talk about the ester family. They're all over the place. They're staring us in the face, but the ester family is probably broader than you even imagined. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the ester family and just a sampling of its many, many members. Um, first of all, what makes the ester family different from other plants, uh, the, the flowers of other plants. If we look at the flower on the left-hand side of this screen, um, this is the flower of one of our spring blooming plants, um, a woodland understory spring of emerald bloodroot. And it's got petals, you know, it looks like not unlike the uh, flower that we see on the right-hand side. Or is this really a flower or is this more than a flower? But the right hand um, image on the screen is a member of the ester family. This particular example, if I remember correctly, was uh, aromatic aster. So what's different? Let's take a look at a classic flower that's not part of the aster family. The potential parts of a standard flower, non-aster family member. If we start at the outside and work our way in, um, there are whorls or circles of flower parts. Not all of, not every species has every one of these parts. But if we start at the beginning or at the outside, we would see sepals potentially. And those are um, often green, but sometimes they're very showy and they act as bud scales before a flower opens. They act to protect the other flower parts before it really opens. And then sometimes they add to the show once the flower is open. Um, the next whorl of, uh, part of flower parts in a classic flower, if they're present, would be petals. And typically there are um, more than one petal. There could be many petals. And their main job is to be showy and attractive and be a signal to pollinators to come visit those flowers, be an attraction to pollinators. Sort of like a neon sign for me. Um, next inside, as we go further into the depths of a flower, we, if these flower parts are present would be the male reproductive parts, the stamens. And they consist of something called a filament, which positions the anther at the top. And the anther is the part of the flower that contains pollen. The anther will release the pollen. Next inside the flower, as we go deeper into the center, would be um, the pistil or pistils. You can actually have more than one. Um, they consist of a stigma, which um, is at the top of the female reproductive part. This is where pollen must be deposited in order for pollination to take place. The pollen travels down the style until it gets to the ovules inside an ovary. Um, so these are the parts of a standard flower. All of them rest on a single receptacle, which is at the top of a stem, a flower stem, also called a peduncle. So that's what a classic flower would look like. And if we go back, this is what the bloodroot flower looks like. We have, you uh, can't really see the sepals, they're underneath the petals, but we can see the petals. We've got male reproductive parts here, and then we've got the female reproductive part. But is that what we have over here? Let's take a look. 
What's different about Astor family members is that what looks to us, what our eyes and brains are probably interpreting as a single flower are, is actually a collection of flowers, sometimes called a composite flower. That's formerly what the name was for this family. And it's actually a densely packed um, group of flowers. Those flowers can be of two different types. The um, one type is called a ray flower, and those are the petal-like things that we see around the outside, typically. Um, the other possible flower type are disc flowers, which tend to be very small, tubular, and often crowded together. Um, all of these flowers rest on a single receptacle, and um, instead of having sepals at the um, outside of this collection, we have um, bud scale like things called bracts that protect this entire flower head before it opens. And they sometimes um, act as part of the display later. Um, they may, they're more likely to be an element that can help you to identify the particular species that you're looking at. So again, if we go back for a sec, um, a standard flower, not an answer family member, all the flower parts for a single flower rest on its own receptacle, which has its own stem or pedicel. Um, so in the case of the aster family, we've got potentially, we've always got many flowers of potentially two different types, ray flowers, which look like petals. And in fact, they are, but they're flowers that consist of only a single petal instead of having many petals. And disc flowers, which are small tubular flowers where the petals have fused to form these little tubes. And again, they all share a single receptacle and there is um, a series of foliage at, underneath them called bracts, um, typically they're leafy, that act as bud scales and protect the flower head before it opens. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the name of this collection of flowers that's referred to as an inflorescence, it could be called a composite flower, a flower head, um, or another name for it is a capitulum. Um, now, some aster family members have both ray flowers and disc flowers, just have disc flowers, some just have disc flowers, some just have ray flowers. In the case where there are both ray flowers and disc flowers, the ray flowers are often there just for show. They're just there to attract pollinators, to be part of the um, attractive display that says, hey, come on, pollinators, come visit because there's plenty of food for you here in the center of this display. Um, it's not always the case, but it's often the case that those ray flowers don't have reproductive parts. In some species, they do. And again, that's only if they're both ray flowers and disc flowers. Um, so if we can look at a standard example. This is one of my personal favorites. This is aromatic aster, which is a lot like New England aster, but it's shorter and bushier and has just tons of flower heads. And it has both ray flowers and disc flowers, which is probably what we typically think about when we think of aster family members, this sort of daisy-like arrangement of flower parts. Um, but often people don't know that this is actually a collection of flowers. And as we look at this, we can see that the ray flowers have all opened and the disc flowers are just gradually open, opening. The, um, the ring of disc flowers around the outside of this cluster have opened, but in the center, there are many disc flowers that have not yet opened. And this is kind of an interesting strategy on the part of the Esther family members because they have all these flowers packed into this, densely packed into this small space, and they open gradually over a period typically of several weeks so that it's, there's a floral display attractive to both us and pollinators for many weeks. And it gives the, the plant many weeks worth of chances to get pollinated and reproduce because that's what it's all about. Um, so many Astor family members have both ray flowers and disc flowers, but there are some that may just have ray flowers like dandelions, for example. They are Astor family members. They only have ray flowers. There are other species that have only disc flowers. This is a, a species called blue mist flower. It consists just of disc flowers and we'll see many other examples in the presentation. 
Uh, the name aster, or the word aster, is actually derived from the Greek or Latin um, words meaning star or star-shaped. And sure enough, um, this typical aster flower head looks a lot like a star. It sort of resembles the shape of the sun, what you think of as a sun, maybe the way you drew a sun when you were a kid. Um, but that's the origin of the word aster. So let's meet some of the family members. And I have to tell you, it's a really big family. There are over 23,000 members. There's about 23,600 members in the Esther family. So we can only look at a sampling of them tonight. We cannot possibly go through all over 23,000 members. Um, but we'll look at an interesting sampling, I think. Um, one of the sort of prototypical asters is New England aster, which we see in the center here. But the goldenrods are also part of the aster family. And there are many other, um, what people sometimes refer to as confusing yellow composites that are part of the aster family. And then I've included just a couple of examples of aster family members that bloom in the shade, at least where I live, and I have them both in my shade garden, white wood aster and blue wood aster. White wood aster is blooming now, blue wood aster is gonna wait another couple of weeks and start blooming at the end of the month, at least where I live. So let's take a look at a few examples. First, um, we tend to associate asters with the fall because they're just so prolific. They're everywhere in the fall. But I did wanna mention the fact that there are really aster family members blooming throughout the growing season, throughout the, the, the lives, the season when plants are up and about and doing their thing. And one that I see in the spring, and maybe you do too, is called green and gold. Another name for it is Virginia Golden Star. And it's um, a relatively, it's kind of a nice short plant, almost could be a ground cover, maybe gets to a max height of about 12 inches. And you can see, if you look at the flower heads, that we have both ray flowers, and in the center, we have disc flowers that again are opening over a period, of, gradually over a period of a few weeks. And this is actually quite a lovely plant. It can sometimes bloom throughout much of the summer and into the fall, depending on the exposure. It tends to bloom more when it gets more sun, but it is a very shade tolerant plant also. Another spring bloomer, at least where I live, um, be the ragworts. And what I see most frequently is the species called golden ragwort. I have it in my shade garden here at just outside the windows. Um, and we can see here, if we look, that it has sort of irregular uh, ray flowers, but plenty of ray flowers. And in the center, we have disc flowers. And it's those disc flowers that are being visited by this little sweat bee who's looking for a little reward for coming to visit these flowers. So plenty of nectar and pollen available. And if you didn't know, um, bees and flies both visit flowers for not just nectar, but also for pollen. Pollen is actually an important source of food for some of those pollen, our, our most common pollinators like bees and flies. Um, so uh, this bee may be gathering both, drinking some for herself. And if she's uh, got her nest already, she may be bringing some back to her nest to feed the kids. Um, the pussy toes are also aster family members. And to me, they're kind of interesting because it's sort of another twist on what the flower structure might look like. Think about standard flowers and just think to yourself, can you think of any plants where male and female flowers are on separate plants? Um, one of the first things that come to my mind is the hollies. The hollies all have male and female flowers on separate plants. Um, if you're familiar with common spice bush, which is one of my favorite spring blooming shrubs, um, that also has male and female flowers on separate plants. But I don't really think about that as much of a possibility for the herbaceous perennials, but that can happen with herbaceous perennials, even aster family members. And this is an example called plantain leaved pussy toes that does have male and female flowers on separate plants. So um, this is um, one of our little nomad bees, I believe, who is visiting the flowers, the male flowers of, uh, or the flowers of male pussy toads. To me, it sort of looks like cupcakes with birthday candles on. So 
something interesting about macro photography. You get to see things in a different light. The female flowers are quite different looking. The, um, the ped pedestal for the flower heads is quite a bit longer, or the stem is quite a bit longer than it is for the male flowers. And the female flower clusters, flower heads look like little pom-poms. Um, but here again, they're being visited by um, fly. And the pussy toes and some related plants are also food plants for the caterpillars of the American lady butterfly. So they play in another important role. Aster family members are hugely important. They, they provide so much food for pollinators during the period while they're blooming, but they also provide plenty of food for other insects as well, larvae of other insects, caterpillars, for example. And in this case, we have um, American lady butterflies using the pussy toes as caterpillar food. Um, another early summer bloomer around where I live is common fleabane, and there are other species that are closely related that look pretty similar. And sure enough, this is an aster family member too. We can see tons of ray flowers, lots of tiny, very narrow little ray flowers, and in the center, a densely packed um, group of disc flowers. Being visited here by, what do you think? Are these bees or are they flower flies? Um, it turns out flies are really an important group of pollinators too. Um, in the North American area, North American region, they're probably second only to bees in their importance as pollinators. Sometimes they take on shapes or uh, disguises to try to look like bees or wasps so that they would be a little more off-putting to a potential predator like a bird or another um, predator that might want to eat an insect. Um, and sometimes that works. So those are some early summer bloomers, uh, spring and summer bloomers. But midsummer, by midsummer, we start to see sort of a real flush of aster family members. The goldenrods begin to bloom, at least around where I live, they start to bloom typically in July. This year, they seem to be later than normal. And I attribute it to the fact that we've been having a drought for about the last six or eight weeks. Things, the plants have just slowed down. And as soon as we do have a little rain, they start to bloom again. Um, and in the center here is New England aster, probably one of the, you know, the iconic, the most iconic of the uh, aster family members, but both are important groups. Um, I should mention that, it, again, they support so many pollinators. They support so many other animals in terms of uh, providing food and shelter. Um, we see birds feeding on the seeds that are produced later in the season after the flowers bloom. Um, there are many, the goldenrods support hundreds of species of insects, not just as pollinators, but um, as other sources of food and shelter. And I'll show you a few examples. Um, they also, the, the aster family members, some of them have medicinal value, even for humans, if we're aware of them. The goldenrods, um, most of them are in the genus Solidago, not all of them. And the word Solidago means to make whole. And that is because it, um, the plants can be used for many medicinal purposes. They've been used for things like um, uh, urinary tract issues, um, treating tuberculosis, diabetes, so many different things. Um, and things like bone set have been used to treat things like dengue fever. So that's kind of just the tip of the iceberg. They provide so much value for wildlife, but also for people. So let's take a look at a few examples of uh, specific species of aster family members. This is one of my favorites because I love the color. Um, this is New York ironweed. And this consists only of disc flowers. So we can see many flower heads over here on the right-hand side, making a big attractive display for so many different pollinators. Large butterflies like the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, small skippers, um, bees of all sizes and shapes like this sweat bee. And what are they doing but coming to visit the disc flowers? Um, this is, the flower heads are comprised solely of disc flowers, long tubular flowers that you can see here. So they're pretty terrific, an example of um, plants with disc flowers only. 
you may or may not have known that thistles are also aster family members. And there are some thistles that are not native and they're invasive. In my area, Canada thistle is um, a problem. It's not even from Canada, it's from Asia. It was just originally discovered in Canada. But there are many species of thistles that are native. And one that I see here in New Jersey is called field thistle. And it again is comprised solely of disc flowers, many tiny little disc flowers being appreciated over here by a pair of uh, great spangled fritillaries. And here we can see three different species dining on flowers in the same flower head. So what a, what a good strategy for the Aster family to have all these flowers packed in this small space, making a gorgeous um, display to attract so many different pollinators. We've got a hummingbird moth. We've got a bee back here that actually specializes on the nectar and specifically the pollen of the thistles. And we've got a honeybee. And I can see that both the honeybee and this other little bee back here are females and the little blobs on their legs, oops, sorry, um, give this away as uh, they're females because they're collecting food to take back to their nest to feed their larva. That food is typically, it's sometimes called bee bread, and it's typically a combination of pollen and nectar and bee saliva, and it's packed on special hairs on their legs that they, they use. So um, again, this, these plants are tremendously valuable to lots of different species. If you're not familiar with the hummingbird moths, they are extremely cute, and they look like a cross between a bumblebee and a hummingbird. And they have, wait, let's go back, extremely long proboscises, um, which you can see here. It helps you to see that, you know, like, yep, I can drink out of a very, very long, very narrow tube to get some food. The blazing stars are also aster family members. And again, these are um, comprised solely of disc flowers, the flower heads, which we can see pretty clearly over here being visited by one of the grass givers. And over here, uh, the flowers are being visited by a monarch. So it can, they can accommodate and attract lots of different pollinators. <clears throat> the Joe pie weeds, also uh, disc family members. They are fabulously attractive to pollinators. Um, I am the count coordinator for a butterfly count that's based, focused um, at Butterf uh, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve just across the river from me in Pennsylvania. And I always schedule it for late July because that's usually when the best, the most dense butterfly populations appear. And also um, some of our best plants are blooming at that time too. Some of our best attractions for butterflies. The Joe pie weeds are usually a really reliable place to look. Just in this one little um, cluster, we've got a couple of Eastern tiger swallowtails, a couple of little peck skippers. Here's another Eastern tiger swallowtail, another peck skipper. So just several butterflies all on one plant, but they also attract bees as well. Um, bone sets are, ha, have been blooming here for a few weeks and still are, and white snake root, uh, similar looking plants. Uh, they're related only in that they're in the same family. Both consist only of disc flowers. And as I mentioned a little while ago, um, bone sets also have um, medicinal value. They're thought to be able to treat uh, some infections. And <clears throat> white snake root, excuse me a sec, <clears throat> Excuse me. White snake root, um, the flower clusters or the flower heads consist only of disc flowers. And it's a pretty interesting plant. Um, it's a plant, plants all have their own strategies for protecting themselves. And the reason some plants have medicinal uses are because they're actually trying to protect themselves from some of the same pressures that we are. And it's just that if we're smart enough, we're able to figure out that, oh, this plant contains something that is of value to me. I mean, just think about, have you ever taken an aspirin? And the, the primary ingredient in aspirin is actually derived from willows, salicylic acid. Um, there's a plant called wild senna. There's a few different species. 
It's a source of senna, which is a laxative, which you may have seen in a product called Senecot. Um, the plants produce those chemicals to protect themselves from herbivores, critters that want to eat them. But sometimes they're useful for us as well. So that's one of the reasons we're able to sometimes um, use plants, take advantage of plants for their medicinal uses. White snake root um, has an interesting strategy for protecting itself. It's chock full of toxins, um, so toxic that um, if cattle were to graze on it, it probably wouldn't kill the cattle. But if they were giving milk and a human drank the milk that was produced or that um, was produced by a cow that ate white snake root, it could be fatal. And in fact, the story is that that's what killed Abe Lincoln's mother was drinking milk that came from a cow that had been grazing on um, white snake root. The, the, there was a disease referred to as uh, milk sickness and it really took a while to actually connect the dots back from the milk to the cows to the white snake root. So um, I don't know if you guys have problems with too many deer where you are, but I do. And this is a plant that's super deer resistant. So it's kind of good for that. Okay, and the um, little bird that we see in the back here, the goldfinch is not there for by coincidence, it's there because I took a photo of it when it was visiting the white snake root plants for the seeds that were produced after the flowers were pollinated. So again, um, the, the work of these plants isn't done or the value they provide to wildlife doesn't end when the, blow, uh, the blooming season is finished. They may produce fruit or food that is eaten by other animals as well. And birds are the one of the likely candidates there. The goldenrods are so gorgeous. Um, if you're thinking, oh, they cause allergies, don't think that, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they have dense clusters, typically of relatively small um, flower heads. So there's an inflorescence within an inflorescence. There's a um, typically large groupings, large inflorescences that may be pyramidal, pyramid shaped, they may be, um, sort of elm shaped. Um, there are some that have flat topped uh, clusters of flowers. There are many different species of goldenrods. Um, there are about four species that I typically see in meadows um, that are fairly common in meadows. Canada goldenrod, um, rough leaved goldenrod, tall goldenrod, and um, late goldenrod. So we have just a couple of examples here, and we can see how attractive they are to butterflies, but other pollinators as well. Bees, flies, wasps, all important pollinators. And if anybody cares about monarchs, goldenrod are one of the groups of plants that can provide them and so many other insects with nectar in the late season. We have to keep them alive, both the adults and the caterpillars. We have to provide food for both. Um, goldenrods don't just provide value to um, other animals through their nectar and pollen, but also through their other plant tissues. And there are uh, some insect species that have evolved to um, take advantage of the goldenrods for their other value. This is something called a goldenrod ball gall. And if you're not familiar with galls, Galls are a plant's reaction to being used by an insect or other invader, an insect, as a source of food and shelter. So a fly, an adult female fly, will lay an egg on the stem of a goldenrod. Her larva, her offspring, will develop inside that stem. And the presence of that insect developing inside the stem triggers a chemical reaction in the, the goldenrod plant to produce this. Um, uh, unnatural uh, or uh, atypical growth that's not part of the standard appearance of a, the stem of a goldenrod. And the insect develops inside that gall. And if it's lucky and it makes it to spring, it emerges as an adult. But there are many things that could prevent that from happening. Um, there are some other insects that just are, I, I refer to as freeloaders. They just sort of cohabit inside the gall and share the food. And they're sort of harmless to the insect that 
um, was the one that initially triggered the gall. But there are other insects that are predators of the insect that's trying to develop inside the gall. And they may, um, those insects would lay their eggs inside the gall before it hardens. Their larva would eat the larva of the insect that caused the gall. And then the other possibility is that, okay, no other insects ate it, but it was a cold winter, snowy winter, not a lot of food, and birds like downy woodpeckers or chickadees can actually tap into that gall and get into it to eat the larva, which is um, interesting because insects are an important source of food for birds, even in the winter. They are in the spring when they're raising their kids, when they're raising their young clutches of birds, baby birds. Um, caterpillars are especially important, but insects are important as a year round food for birds. And the galls are one of the sources of insects for some birds. Um, over on the left-hand side of this slide, we see another kind of gall. It's um, referred to as um, a rosette. Uh, it's caused by a midge that's, again, developing inside the stem. The egg is laid at the top of the stem. It causes this, the um, goldenrod to stop growing straight up. Often it branches around this point and continues to bloom. But um, the leaves will continue to grow and develop at the point where the stem will no longer grow up. And I have read that up to over 60 additional species, species of insects use this gall as their habitat. So goldenrods are just you know, hugely important as a, a habitat source and food source. Um, some other species of goldenrods that you probably would be less likely to see in meadows, this one definitely not, this is um, called reef goldenrod or blue stemmed goldenrod. It's a species that is typically a woodland understory species and does really nicely in a shade garden. I have it here where I live because that's what I have, I have shade. Um, the center species you would see in a meadow. This one is grass-leaved goldenrod, sometimes referred to as flat-topped goldenrod. Its flower clusters tend to be flat-ish. Um, and this is one of the first goldenrod species that I typically see blooming. Often I see it blooming by the middle of July and maybe even earlier. This year, it was August really before I saw much in bloom. And I really think it had to do with the drought we were experiencing. Over on the left-hand side is showy goldenrod. And this is a really nice garden plant, actually. Um, but you may also see it in meadows. It can tolerate at least part shade. And one of the reasons it's called showy goldenrod is because each individual flower head is actually larger than the typical goldenrod flower head. Um, and again, very attractive to lots of different pollinators, all the goldenrods. Uh, some other species that are not shown here, but that can be nice garden plants are zigzag goldenrod, which is another shade species, another woodland understory species called zigzag because its stem zigzags a bit and the flower clusters are both at the top of that stem and also at the leaf axils, the points where leaves are attached to the main stem. Uh, stiff goldenrod um, is a little larger. Um, but it's got a nice habit and also large flower clusters uh, or flower heads. Uh, and sweet goldenrod is uh, sort of a nice species, one of the earlier blooming goldenrods. Um, the general shape of it is like the Canada goldenrods and the rough leaf goldenrods, but it tends to be smaller in size. So back to this issue of does goldenrod cause allergies? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, plants, any plant that has bright showy flowers has, has evolved to attract partners in pollination, typically insects, to come visit those flowers, pick up pollen and take it to another plant to try to help achieve cross-pollination. So the, the pollen, in species that have bright showy flowers is heavy, it's waxy, it's designed, it's evolved to stick to somebody who's there to pick it up. A bee, a fly, a wasp, a hummingbird moth, a butterfly. Um, it's not designed, it's not light and fluffy, so it's not going to be picked up and carried by the wind. 
as a result, it's not going to find its way up your nose. So flowers with uh, plants with bright showy flowers are not causing your allergies. It's the plants with inconspicuous flowers like ragweeds. We have here common ragweed and tall ragweed or giant ragweed, both of which have very inconspicuous flowers. You can walk right by them and not notice them. And they might be right next to a goldenrod and people go, oh, my eyes are itchy, I'm sneezing, my nose is running. And they look around and see these bright show of yellow flowers, the goldenrods, and that's who they blame. It's guilt by association, but it's not the goldenrods that are causing the problem. So tell your friends, um, late season allergies would be caused by things like ragweed, um, also by grasses that are blooming in, late in the summer and early fall. In the spring, it's likely to be trees. Many trees are rough when pollinated. So not goldenrod, not anything that has bright showy flowers because they have a completely different pollination strategy. The inconspicuous flowers are on plants whose strategy is to be winded. So the pollen's light, fluffy, can easily go up your nose. And with ragweed, the pollen grains are light and fluffy, but they're also kind of jagged. And so therefore they can like grab hold of the inside of your nose pretty easily and can cause irritation. So anyway, um, other aster family members, black-eyed Susan and all of its lookalikes, its relatives are aster family members. And I'm showing three close relatives of black-eyed Susan. Starting on the left, we have a thin-leaved goldenrod, which is, um, I like it a lot. It's not a very long lived perennial. It probably lives three or four years, but it reproduces pretty prolifically. And it um, typically here where I live blooms into early November, which is pretty good for New Jersey. And it's, if it gets enough sun, it branches nicely and produces many flowers. It gets sort of a bushy look to it, as you can see here on the left. Um, another name for it is, uh, well, the, the scientific name is Rebecca triloba, and the triloba refers to the lower leaves, which tend to have three lobes, unless they've died off already, which is a way to help you identify it. But the flowers are smaller than you would expect on Black-Eyed Susan, and the plant is much more branched than you would expect for Black-Eyed Susan. Probably pretty similar to Black-Eyed Susan is Eastern Coneflower. Um, this again, tends to have smaller flowers than the typical black-eyed Susan. Um, but other than that, the habit, habit is very similar. Um, it's a less leafy plant and each flower has its own stem um, that purchases up to make it available to pollinators. And probably the most similar to black-eyed Susan is showy cone flower, um, which has probably somewhat larger flowers than black-eyed Susan. The leaf structure looks very similar, um, but the whole plant is slightly less hairy than black-eyed Susan. And I mentioned these three species because black-eyed Susan is basically a biennial, which means that it lives two years. Um, the first year, it's leaves at the base of the plant, a basal rosette. The second year, it sends up a flower shoot. Um, and then unless it reproduces successfully, that's the last you'll see of it. These all tend to have longer lives. They're longer lived perennials, so they can be nice garden additions. Gray headed cone flower. I don't see a lot, but this is something that you'd see in a meadow perhaps. Um, it's a very tall plant typically. It's usually gonna be six feet tall thereabouts um, when the conditions are good for growing. It has both ray flowers and disc flowers, which we also saw with the cone flowers that we just looked at. And the ray flowers are curved back from the um, receptacle that contains the disc flowers that are blooming gradually. And again, it's starting from the outside of this receptacle, the outside of the cluster and working its way all the way to the top. So only some of the disc flowers are in bloom. The rest are in bud. So for many weeks, this flower will be in bloom. Good for us, good for the pollinators, good for the plant. This is one of my personal favorites, green-headed cone flower. One of the things I like about it is the fact that the disc flowers are big enough that you can easily see them. 
And again, this is a species, that, the confusing yellow composites, some of which we're looking at now, all tend to have um, both grape, mostly tend to have both grape flowers and disc flowers. There are always exceptions. And the disc flowers are pretty visible. And when I first encountered these two little critters, the um, American copper and the bumblebee, they were kind of bickering over territory, but they pretty quickly settled things and realized that there was food enough for both of them. And sure enough, there they are both eating happily. And again, we can see that the disc flowers are opening gradually from the bottom of this cluster to the top. So blooming for many weeks. And when the bloom is done, plenty of food left over for birds. And I always see goldfinches um, browsing here for food on the heads of uh, green-headed coneflower, looking for seeds. Uh, another yellow composite is wing stem. It doesn't have a lot of rays or ray flowers but it has just enough to add to the attractive display that's provided by the disc flowers. Again, the disc flowers are sort of large enough to be able to see them individually. Um, and they provide food for lots of different pollinators. We can see many bees here, mostly sweat bees, it looks like on um, this um, plant. And over here, we've got a bumblebee. Look what a great job this bumblebee is doing, collecting pollen and being able to bring that pollen to the next plant. Um, if you're not familiar with this species, an identification characteristic is reflected in its name, wing stem, and that is that the stem of the plant, the main stem of the plant, has some uh, leafy appendage up and down the edges. Um, this is another species that here where I live is pretty deer resistant, which is an important characteristic for me. Maybe not for you. You have to let me know. Um, Helen's flower, also called sneezeweed. This, I just think, is such a pretty plant. It has such lovely flower heads. Um, each ray flower has three notches at the tip, and it, they're just so perfect and you know neat looking. I don't know, I can't, I can't find the right words to describe why I like them, but they're just lovely. And again, many disc flowers on this head. It's the disc flowers that are doing all the work of producing the pollen and the nectar. The ray flowers are there for the show to say, hey, have I got food for you? And here we have um, a sachem butterfly drinking nectar. The sunflowers are all part of the aster family. And I've included just one example, but all of them are um, consist of both ray flowers and disc flowers. Um, the ray flowers typically have uh, no reproductive parts. They're there just for the floral display to attract the pollinators to the disc flowers in the center. This particular species is called thin-leaved uh, sunflower, Halianthus decapetalus. Decapetalus refers to the fact that on average, the heads have about 10 petals, but you'll see more or less. A few other um, interesting yellow composites are the beggar ticks. Um, they're given this name as a group because of their the fruits that are produced because they have little um, hooks on them to hitch a ride. Many of the aster family members disperse their seeds with the assistance of wind. They're insect pollinated, but they're partnering with the wind to disperse their seeds. The seeds often have light fluffy stuff attached to them like little umbrellas that can be easily caught up in the wind to disperse them. And they usually typically produce many. The bigger ticks have a different strategy for their seed dispersal. And that is that the fruits that are produced, which we might interchangeably refer to as seeds, but they're really fruits, have these little prongs attached um, that hook a, hitch a ride. These are um, all annuals, um, and we have three examples here. Tick seed sunflower, which um, you may see, uh, it's very common late in the season. You may see it along roadsides, um, you may see it in meadows. Um, in the center, we see nodding fir marigold. This is a plant that prefers moist soil, and you'll often see it around a pond's edge. And um, the last is beggar ticks. These first two species have both ray flowers and disc flowers. This species has only disc flowers and it's pretty inconspicuous, but pollinators still find it. It's a fairly low growing plant typically, 
you might see it as high as 12 or 15 inches, but often it's sort of sprawling at ground level. It tends to depend on um, how much sun it gets, what kind of growing conditions it has. And just to give you an example, these are some of the fruits that are produced. This was from tick seed sunflower. The, the seeds or fruits have these little hooks that easily hitch a ride. This is from another species that we didn't see called Spanish needles. And its fruits are long and narrow, sort of like a needle with little hooks at the tips, again, to hitch a ride. Now, the classic um, asters, New England aster. Fabulous purple colors. There are some that will also be in sort of a bright pink shade. Um, I typically see these begin to bloom in mid-July and they'll almost always bloom into early October. And again, the ray flowers are there for the floral display. And it's the disc flowers that are doing a lot of the work of uh, providing food in the form of nectar and pollen for pollinators like this little sweat bee. Um, I've mentioned aromatic aster. I really like it. It, um, the flower heads look very much like New England aster. They tend to be maybe a little more blue, but the, um, the habit, the growth habit of the plant overall is shorter, it's denser, and it's much more branched, sort of bushy looking. So it produces lots and lots of flowers. And it can, um, if you're not looking for something as tall as a New England aster, aromatic aster is a good choice. Um, and it, it is very dense, it's great. Um, and we see it here being enjoyed by a common buckeye and by a pair of bees. One bee is just hanging on for a ride. Insects just impress me so much by their ability to both eat and mate at the same time. So we've got a female eating, collecting food to, to um, provision her nest, while at the same time, she's mating. Multi-talented. Um, there are several species that you could lump into the category of small white aster. Uh, I've included two here. This one is called all aster. Um, it's given that name because of the shape of its leaves, sort of like the tool and all. Um, and it's sort of an open habit, um, not super densely leaved. It's a little bit larger than some of the other small white asters. Calico aster is another of the species. Um, the, a way to identify them is to see that some of the leaves on the flower, on the plant branches that have the flowers, the leaves are sort of pointing backwards towards the main stem of the plant. And that's a good way to identify it. Uh, white wood aster, great woodland understory or shade garden plant. I have it in my garden and it's being, it's blooming now, making food available to pollinators. And start noticing here um, that the disc flowers, some are yellow, some are pink. I wonder what that's all about. Well, the, um, many of the aster family members, it hasn't been as obvious on some of the other species that we've looked at, but they mostly share this trait. Um, the disc flowers on these sort of classic asters will often begin with a yellow color, various shades of yellow. And as they're pollinated, they turn pink. And that's a signal to the pollinators that, hey, don't bother to visit the pink flowers, stick with the yellow flowers. That's where you'll find food and uh, food, nectar and pollen. And this is a really interesting strategy of the plants because it's, it's making the most efficient use of the insect pollinators. And it's also protecting the flowers that have already been pollinated. Um, so it's, it's really a very effective strategy. And one of the reasons that this color change works well is that pink flowers or the bees are red colorblind. So pinks and reds, while bees may visit them, they're not as attractive to bees as other colors like the yellow that we have here. So this is blue wood aster, again, a, a woodland understory aster that does great in a shade garden. I love it. Um, blooms into November here at my house um, in New Jersey, which is pretty good for New Jersey. It's also called heart-leaved aster because the leaves are kind of heart-shaped. 
And again, it accommodates lots of different pollinators. We have several sweat bees here. Looks like a um, carpenter bee butt over here and um, a cloud, clouded sulfur as well in late October. So um, all of the plants that I've talked about are aster family members and they're all native to North America. And they're native certainly to my region. And I think many of them are native to yours as well. Why are they important? They're important because they provide food, shelter, and medicine for all species, even us, even humans. Um, they photosynthesize, so they help to produce the, uh, the oxygen that we need to breathe. They help mitigate climate change by reducing air temperature, sequestering carbon, helping the ground to absorb storm water, and reducing fossil fuel usage. So, Plant Native, which I know is your mission. So <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Marianne. This is really good. Um, I, I have some questions for you. Okay. And the first one is going to uh, call you right up front on uh, the taxonomic reclassifications within the Aster family. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, uh, is there something specific? So, uh, you know, once upon a time, when I first got involved with this, I was told, use the scientific names. The scientific names never change. And um, then quickly they started to change. You know, how annoying is that? Yes. And um, initially, you know, in the early centuries, the classification of plants was based on the flower structure. And then DNA testing came along. So um, many plants have been reclassified because of DNA testing. And often it's not something that we can easily see with our eyes. So it may not be something that we can easily use as an identification characteristic. Ah, the grass leaf goldenrod has a different genus because of some visible characteristic, not anything that I've been able to see. So um, it's DNA testing that has thrown things up for grabs and reclassify things. You'll still see a lot of the other classifications. Many of the species that I just went through where the um, genus was Symphiotrichum um, were asters. You'll see that name used in some, um, some references today and easily, and even places that are um, selling plants, which, you know, one of the rules that I give people is when you go shopping, try to make sure that you know the scientific name if you're looking for something specific because common names are not always common. I mean, they may be different. It may be used for something that, um, you know, the name you're looking for as a common name may be given to something that you really didn't intend. Um, but the Aster family members are probably the most problematic because there have been so many changes and it's kind of all over the place in terms of who's using the old names versus who's using the new names. And then sometimes the new names are changed to other new names. So it can be a little tricky, but um, you need to- Yeah, <laughs> I, laughed, I laughed when I saw the, the wood asters because, um, because yeah, I think Eurybia is one that they use for, for that in place of the simple trichome. Uh, the, yeah, for the wood asters. Right. I, and I think that um, both of those used to be aster a few. Yeah, both ago. of them did. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, okay, among my, so I have a short attention span. So I do a lot of different things. And I've been shopping for plants for some gardens in the town that I live in. And the, the company that I'm buying plants from uses aster for everything. And I'm like, but well, wait a minute. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> That's good. Um, next up, we are wondering if there are any tips for growing aster, particularly like New England or similar variety from seed. Um, you always kind of want to make sure that um, you're going to give them the kind of habitat that they want. I don't think you have to be, you know, super careful about the soil. If you're, if you're starting it, there are a couple of ways you can do it. You can start it in a pot and then plant it. Um, in the ground, or you can just scatter the seeds. When you do seed scattering, one of my um, best friends in this business recommends just doing a little bit of a twist um, with your foot to make sure that the seed has good contact with the soil because the seeds need good contact with the soil in order to germinate and grow. Um, 
you often, most of the time, you really don't want to bury the seeds because, and, and this is pretty much true of no matter what species you're talking about, because if you think about what would happen in nature, they're not going to be buried even a quarter of an inch down. They, they might be just half covered with dirt, you know, a little soil blew over them after they landed, that kind of thing. So you want to make sure that they're, they, they have good contact, closely adhere to um, the soil, but don't bury them. When you bury them, you're cutting off their access to the sun, which they also need to be able to germinate. So I, I would suggest that is kind of um, a rule of thumb, no matter what species you're trying to grow and um, whether you're using pots or whether you're doing it directly outside. Hope that helps. Yeah. One of our um, one of our water quality specialists who adds native plantings just said, you know, just use a smooth smooth um, shoe, yeah, uh, and just walk across once you throw it out and walk across it, and then you're done. Yep. Um, but it, th that doesn't always account for the birds and squirrels that like to pick them up. <laughs> That's true. So maybe you need to like put out a little more seed than you thought. And uh, yeah. anyway. Um, so, uh, will Bowman be restarting the Millersville Native Plant Conference? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I think that's still under discussion. There, um, you know, the, the the pandemic was really disruptive for everybody. Um, I enjoyed it, and I'd love it if they did, but um, I have not heard that they're going to. So we'll see. Um, that's that's a tough call for you know all yeah. of the groups that do things like that. So. Uh, Next up, your photos are magnificent, which I agree. Um, what uh, camera and lens do you use most of the time, given that you need to be ready and fast to capture these insects? Right. Um, most of the time, well, my camera is a Canon Rebel. Um, I've used a few different models. Mine now is a few years old. Um, but the lens that I use most of the time for these photos is um, a Sigma macro lens. It's 180 millimeters. And I've probably had that lens for like 20 years. And it's really stood me in good stead. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, speaking, I think of Sneezeweed, if I'm not mistaken, right now should be a pretty spectacular show uh, down at Reflection Riding. They have a whole field. Um, I and should then, where the name came uh -huh. Uh, I should have mentioned where the name came from, and I don't think I did. Again, okay. it, it doesn't, it's not like it's, it's pollen is going to cause allergies. It's because it, um, the flower parts used to be dried and used as snuff, and pretty much anything that you put up your nose is going to make you sneeze. So it's not a plant that causes allergies. So, <laughs> go on <laughs> yeah so many of our our native plants that are just wonderful for all of our insects you know get that nice little moniker of weed yeah um, yeah so uh stokes aster i understand one of the first regular asters in bloom in summer how long do they last are they good for a garden um so, <laughs> that's a trick question <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say just about any plant um, can be good for a garden. I'm not as familiar with Stokes Aster. I'm uh, somewhat familiar with it. I don't really see it around here. Um, but just about any Aster family member is going to be lasting um, in terms of its bloom period. I assume that's what you mean for probably about eight weeks, maybe more. Um, and um, you know, if it's, you just need to look up the um, attributes of it and make sure that no matter what you're planting, it's in, you know, the kind of environment that that plant prefers. Um, so for example, if it's something that's sun loving, if you put it in the shade, it's probably not going to bloom as you would prefer. So, you know, try to match it to the right uh, kind of location. Soil moisture is a little more fungible, but um, and plants that like moist soil can sometimes tolerate dry soil. But you, again, you wanna to try to match it with the growing conditions. Yeah, that was kind of a trick question for you because first it's a, it's a stochesia, which is, it's in the aster family, but it's, um, yeah, it is one of those that they've separated out. And also it's a Southeastern United States ah. plant. So. I've seen it <laughs> so, in the field guys, but I haven't seen it in the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, it, you kind of need to do your research on the plant and, you know, put it where it wants to be. And if it, if it grows to the height that you like, then fine. You know, and I think it's a fabulous plant. garden plant. Um, I imagine Dennis could probably also say that whether he likes it or not. Um, 
also, can you talk about common diseases for asters? Um, Mary has a big leaf aster that appears to have fungus. They are a, in a sun, part sun location. Um, so they're, they're one of those uh, wood asters. They, ha, it, they um, Eurybia macrophylla right. um, or Symphotracum macrophylla. Um, do you have any ideas about fungus on this? Um, I really haven't seen, I typically do not see a lot of problems with fungus on asters. Um, you know, again, you probably want to make sure that it has the kind of um, habitat that it prefers. Otherwise, it may be kind of stressful. Um, that's about all I can say. Sorry. Yeah, I, I have some, and in, in my reading was that they are, you know, part sun. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't, people, yeah. But I don't know any problems with them. Um, I'm not aware of any either. Okay, regarding the pink on asters showing that they were already pollinated, which not only improves efficiency of the flowers, of the pollinators to go to the yellow, but also protects the flowers that were already pollinated. Question, why do the pink flowers that already had the nectar removed need protection? I think you kind of touched on that. Right, I, let me just clarify. Um, so the flowers, Stop. It's not like the flowers are trying to protect the nectar or the pollen. That stuff is there um, for two purposes. The nectar is there strictly to attract pollinators. The pollen is there. Um, the plants would love for it to all be used for pollination, but it turns out really only about 2% of pollen is actually used for pollination. The other 98% is there to pay off the pollinators. Um, but so once pollination has occurred, so pollen has been moved from one flower to another, the puddle down um, to the ovaries and, uh, you know, matched up with the ovules. Great. The flowers have been pollinated. So no reason for some critter to be going in there disturbing the, um, the ovules because now the plant wants to um, change gears. That, that individual disc flower is ready to change gears from trying to attract pollinators to trying to have that um, ovary mature as a fruit. We'll think of it probably as a seed. So it's to protect that process that's in progress of um, evolving or um, changing from um, you know, the flower parts to the fruit that is protected. And there's no reason it's not producing any nectar anymore. Um, just stay out of here, don't mess it up. So it, it's protecting the developing fruit basically by changing the flower color of the disc flower. And it's not providing any reward, so don't waste your time, um, but it's not trying to protect nectar. Nectar's only produced and plants can actually control when they produce nectar or not. Um, so they might not pr be producing it 24 hours a day. Probably it's only during the day when pollinators are active, things are like that. So that's something that plants can control. So I hope I didn't go off track too much. No, that, that answered very well. Um, I think it's very difficult to identify individual species of asters. Do you have a simple way or suggestion to make that easier? <laughs> um, it, it's not always easy, but you always start with the basics, I think. And that is like, well, what's the color of the flowers? Um, so there's a woman that I was privileged to work with a little bit at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, who was one of the, she was the primary author of a book called The Plants of Pennsylvania. So she knew a lot more than I did. And I can tell you that even she said, sometimes you just have to see the flowers before you can identify them, you know, specifically. So wait till you see the flowers, check to see what color the flowers are. And then those to me are among the most easy things to identify, but other, um, you know, so if the flower color, the flower head size, you know, does it have both ray flowers and disc flowers or just one or the other? What is the color of each? Um, what is the size of the flower head? Um, with there's the, I, I teach a longer class about asters and there's this group referred to as a small white aster. Sometimes it's the, the bracts, those leafy appendages underneath the flower head that were um, acted like um, 
bud scales before the flower head opened. Sometimes it's the characteristics of the bracts. Are they curved back a little bit or do they sort of hug the underside? Um, what do the leaves look like? Um, are the leaves directly attached to the stem or do the leaves have their own stem? Um, there are so many and how, how big are the leaves? So like big leaf aster that you talked about a few minutes ago, that one's fairly easy to see. And then, oh yeah, just in case there weren't already so many, like over 23,000 asters and they weren't hard enough, they're a little on the promiscuous side and so they can hybridize freely. Um, so you may see, which I've seen in my own garden, interestingly enough, I've seen what looks to me like hybridization of bluewood aster and calico aster. So um, that can make it challenging too. So it can be a lifelong game and learning experience to try to identify all the asters. But there's, there's many different characteristics. Start with the flower heads. I like to start with the really easy ones too. Me too. Um, like, like aromatic aster or Stokes aster. They're, they're very different. <laughs> the wood yeah. asters are a little easier. <laughs> so for every, you know, every different group of plants, I'm like, start with the easy ones and work your way up from there. Build from there. You got to build your confidence. Yeah. Um, in here, I just want to say there are tons and tons of thank you so much. Um, this was really great. Excellent. Uh, they've learned all kinds of new things about asters. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just really good to hear so much interesting information. Um, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Found it helpful. Yes, very. The uh, I see one other question, but it relates to Stokes Aster, and so I don't know, and I'll open it up to anyone who does, um, it tends to flop. Is there anything to do about that? They're in sun slash part sun. I, I would say that if they were in full sun, they might flop less, but I I don't know. Here's a couple of, else? I have a couple <laughs> of just general suggestions, but if anybody has specific suggestions for that. And one is that it might need some companion plants that are growing with it that might help to keep it standing. Maybe something shorter um, underneath it, maybe something that bloomed earlier, or just you know something that is compatible looking and you know looks good with it. Sometimes they just plants just need companions, you know, to help them. That's one thing. Some plants can also tolerate being um, sort of nipped at the early part of the season, and then they'll branch out more. Um, but I don't know. So if you guys have specific suggestions for Stokes Aster, feel free. I'm not hearing anybody jump in, in on that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Hey, uh, Christina, that was my question. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea to plant a companion plant um, with my Stokes Aster. Good. And I also think they might need to be divided. They've been in the ground maybe four growing seasons now, three or four, and I'm going to try doing that this fall, and I'll plant something close by and see if that yeah. helps. Yeah, so, thank you. so they can stand and help each other stand up. Yes. Like, and yes. there's so much we don't know, like they might even be sharing nutrients underground, so. That's right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mary. All right, that is, that is all of the questions that I see in the chat. I don't think I missed anything. If I did, um, we'll take a minute to see if anyone has a question that we that I may have missed or that they didn't think of to put in chat. And then, all right. It looks like that's got them all, Marian. Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. We had uh, over 90 people tonight, so that's excellent. And we, we really are excited for that. Um, again, yeah. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, all right. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.